are gonna do is this. Okay. So we have transport in plants. Now, what we need to do is be able to identify these two topics separately. Our first topic is something that is related to um, paper three or related to the diagram based topics, which is identifying and being able to draw and recognize these. Um, the second, the second to uh, topic is related to transport mechanisms. We need to be able to talk about these transport mechanisms. Some of this we're going to do briefly today. The details we're going to do tomorrow. Um, yeah, that's basically how oh, we're going to go about it. Okay, so um, you guys have had an overview of this. So the first question that should come to your mind when we're talking about transport, transport in within a plant is why do we need transport? So why do we need this transport? We know that plants have, um, plants themselves have a need for energy, right? They need nutrition. And more than nutrition, they need everything, just like us, just like we have vessels that ooze out blood. The transport system of plants is essentially similar to vessels. It's also like a vascular system. It has different, uh, different types of vessels. It does not have a capillary artery or vein. It has different vessels, but it does have something similar to vessels for carrying their needs. What are their needs? They need from the root tip to the tip of the leaf, they need nutrients, they need energy, they need ions, they, they need water circulation, they need so many things to be circulated and anything that is stagnant is dead, which means they need continuous flow, just like us humans. And we know they don't have a heart for this pumping system. So what are some of the ways in which this pumping system is ensured that it, its flow remains continuous? There is no stopping the flow. Um, so let's see how we go about that. Okay, so understand, we need to understand that the vascular system it just means vessel and it's not limited to uh, animals only. It can be present in plants and it can be present um, in, uh, you know, different organisms. And in this, we're essentially talking about plants. And what are the vascular systems in plants? They are the xylem and the phloem. Now, because you guys have some idea of the syllabus, you already know what the xylem and the phloem are. All we need to do is little bit details um, I'm not going to do all the details in this topic because I want to talk about these details when we're doing um, the, the first part, which is the drawing and understanding the sections, which is the practical portion of this topic. So what is the xylem and the phloem? Essentially, one thing that you need to know is that xylem is what carries waters and minerals. It is our essential mode of transport for water and min minerals. And so water and minerals generally need, if water, where does water in a plant come from? The water in a plant comes from a root. That's something we know as a child. So what that essentially means is if water is only entering from one end of the plant, which is the root, and it's only moving upwards to the leaf, and new water is always available, which means that within the xylem that carries the water, you only need water to flow in one direction from the root to the leaf tip, and which is essentially what these red arrows are showing, that the, the direction is singular, it's upwards, there is no downward direction as compared to these arrows. The phloem carries organic molecules. Now, when you're talking about organic molecules, one thing you know for sure is that organic molecules, the plant can make anywhere, right? Because every cell is making some type of, some type of organic molecule. Um, you know that because how carbohydrates are made from that equation you did as a child uh, from a carbon dioxide and water combined together to give us oxygen and carbohydrates. And so it, they're made everywhere where there is chlorophyll to absorb sunlight, right? And so if they are, they are made everywhere, if they're made at the top of the cell, then there is a high need to transfer these to areas where there is no sunlight and no chlorophyll can act. For instance, the root, which is why the arrows downwards are as important as the arrows upwards. You need to be able to deliver substances upward to the new sprouting leaves that cannot yet make for themselves. But the older leaves or the newer leaves also need to make food and transport it down to the roots which cannot make it for themselves in any case and they need to survive to be able to absorb everything right 
so that is one important component of what is being carried in both of them so water and minerals and organic molecules then the direction of flow one way only and this is bidirectional okay and then the next thing is understanding their structure so the structure of xylem all the structure of xylem is a dead tube there is no living cell there's only these they, there's only these uh, sides of a dead tube, no cross walls. The cell has died. There is no nucleus, no mitochondria, nothing. And the cross walls have been cleared to give us a clear path, a path that does not have hindrances on its way. Okay. So uh, the outer cells are not living. Um, these cells have been cleared out. And this deposition around these cells is called lignin deposition. You've done this in your O-level. Lignin deposition can occur in many multiple ways. So it's basically, so how a xylem forms is basically these cells were destined to be xylem. Now they have a nucleus, they have a cytoplasm, they have back holes, everything a normal cell does, right? What ends up happening is, that um, there is, and this is obviously cellulose outside forming the cell wall, lignin comes in and deposits on the side. This is lignin. Lignin is different from our cellulose cell wall. Remember that it's not the same. And then it forms this thick deposition. And then central apoptosis takes place as central apoptosis takes place, this cell is cleared. But then lignin that was in the cell on the sides remains because it was a solid material. It's stuck to it, which is why this lignin remains and this forms a hollow tube in which water can flow in one direction. Now this deposition can be different. Sometimes if I'm giving you three different tubes, there, some, some may have a circular deposition of lignin some may have completely uh, completely circular, there is no gaps, it's completely filled, and there are little holes which form something called pits. These small holes form pits. These have just circular deposition and lots of non-deposited area. Some may have linear deposition. So lignin distribution patterns can be very different. You should be able to identify uh, the difference in the uh, patterns is because of deposition of lignin. Ideally, the xylem vessel is the same. As you can see over here is that this, uh, this is also a xylem and this is also a xylem. This xylem has different distribution of lignin. The cells are thinner. This has much thicker distribution of lignin. Maybe this one smaller one is a new one. It's a protoxylum, which means it's still developing. It's in the earlier forms. The metaxylum, much larger, um, the much more clear, hollow on the inside. This one still has some cells. You can appreciate the there are double cells over here with their cell walls are apparent. The, look at this one. Look at the, can you appreciate these lines in the center, which means that the cell walls in the centers have not been cleared yet. They are being cleared, but not cleared yet, as opposed to what we have called a phloem. Phloem has living cells. This one complete cell is a living cell. The only difference is it has much fewer organelles because it is also used for transport and it has no lignin deposition on the sides. We need this cell to be alive to make sure that we can control the direction of flow. So these are living cells. And at the corner, at the end of each cell joining another cell, there are um, the, the, cell, the cell walls and the membranes that were here totally cleared to give zeros anything. There are holes present here called sieves. They, they look just like the strainer of a sieve. They have holes for ease of transport. Um, and to control the direction of the transport, it just made sure that this cell is living. And closely associated with one cell of phloem, so you can appreciate this as a cell. Um, it has a lot of substance in it, just like this white substance in the xylem. Um, it has a lot of substance in it, but it is still a living cell. It, this living cell will still have a back wall. And look at this, where it's meeting the next cell, it has little holes, perforations over here. These perforations are the sieve elements or the sieves, and together they form sieve plate as 
uh, holes from this come in touch with this one, they form a sieve plate. And each phloem cell is associated with a companion cell. These over here are companion cells. Companion cells are filled with all the structures the phloem cell does not have. For instance, phloem cell um, does not need a lot of mitochondria. It ne needs energy to control these bidirectional processes, but it does not need a lot of mitochondria. Otherwise, mitochondria will hamper with the movement of organic molecules. So companion cell will be filled with mitochondria. It will provide all the ATP this cell needs, which means there must be a small, um, uh, there must be small species here for easy trans communication. And you remember uh, plant cells have openings between cells called plasmodesmata. So those are these plasmodesmata. These sieve elements or sieve plates that form here are larger and much bigger and higher in number than the simple plasmodesmata which is why they're not called plasmodes matter. They are proper holes, like a strainer. They're, there's, there's very little cell wall and cell membrane outside, okay? They keep a strainer, a tea strainer or a coffee strainer in your mind. Imagine that the cell to be that way. Plasmodes matter, on the other hand, are just, if you remember, single hole, singular holes for organelle transport. So again, you can appreciate uh, both of them here. You can appreciate their position and flowing vessels will have companion cells. Now, moving on to the processes we uh, discussed, uh, the process before we go into details of these. Um, so the processes we need to understand are essentially two processes. There is an epoplastic pathway and a symplastic pathway. So we need to be able to understand both of these pathways differently. Before we understand these pathways, we need to look at the structure that absorbs these water, minerals, and everything. So the structure is very easy. You have, uh, and this one is essentially for the xylem vessel for because we are understanding water absorption. The, these pathways are essentially for water absorption, right? Um, food will, the, the organic material will, can dissolve in water and transport through these ways, but mostly the way that it transports through is called a mass movement or mass effect that we will do later. So right now we are talking about the transport in one of these vessels, which is the xylem vessel. So now let's start with seeing the entire root of the xylem vessel. We know that it must extend from the root to the leaf. And we know in the middle, the plant, it's just a, this vessel that we keep talking about. So we need to see two locations. We need to see the root and we need to see the leaf. Let's start with the root. In the root, we have these root hair cells. As you can appreciate, there's an elongation for easier absorption. And this area of the root hair cells is divided into three, uh, three individual parts. There is a part called an epidermis, and I, I told you that uh, whenever we're talking about epi, it means outside of the skin. Uh, if you guys, okay, so uh, if you guys remember, cells on the outside most layer are called epi, and cells on the inside most layer are called endo, okay? So we have an epidermis and an endodermis. Um, and in the middle, anything that's in the middle is always called either a cortex or a medulla. Over here, it's a cortex, okay? I'm mentioning a medulla because you need to know it uh, in case it ever comes up in any other structure in the diagram. So epi on the outside, cortex medulla on the inside. Cortex is comes right after an epi. Epi, cortex, uh, inside of a cortex is usually a medulla. And then it, the innermost is an endodermis. Epidermis and endodermis are single layers of cell. They're both called dermis because they're outermost layers. Um, and the outermost in touch with the uh, environment is epi. And, and the innermost dermis in touch with the, uh, the cells of the body is endo. Cortex are basically the number of cells inside. They're not a singular cell. I know this diagram represents a singular cell layer, but it's not a singular cell layer. So just make sure this is for ease of, um, just so you don't get confused. Okay. So what happens is that water is absorbed. Now, once water is absorbed, water can either be absorbed into the cell, like this red arrow, notice my arrow here. So water was absorbed into the cell. Then it moved across the cell, it moved through the plasmodesmata, these holes between cell, uh, plant cells, from one cell to another cell to another cell, 
and then it enter the xylem, right? And this process is very slow because it has to cross cell walls, cell membranes. Many times it will enter into aqual, cross vacuole. So essentially anytime water molecules enter into, through the cell membrane, into the cell, they have entered into the apoplast, um, into the apoplastic pathway, okay? And any time they don't enter the cell, they travel only in the cell walls. As you can see here, traveling only in the cell walls, they have entered a symplastic pathway. But there is one thing you need to note over here. In the endodermis, the innermost layer before the actual organs of the cell come in contact, the plant controls water and stuff entering it. How does it control it? Every cell in the endodermis pathway has a barrier to water on the outside. The cell walls, look at these cell walls, are attached to each other with a central lignin deposit, just like this lignin outside of the xylem that was making it strong and concrete and preventing the leakage of water. There is some deposit over here, which is known as a Casparian strip. It's a single strip. And what that strip does is it prevents water from going inside the body of the cell unchecked. Because after this is the body of the cell. And for instance, if there was any poison in the water, if, it, if there is a poison, obviously that poison cannot move through the cell membrane. It's, it will remain on the outside, right? But if it starts entering through the symplastic pathway, through the cell walls, it cannot be regulated because it's not entering the cell membrane. It's just going through and through from the outside. It's, it's Imagine this as the inside the city and imagine this as the highway. It's going through the highway. So how do you stop bandits from leaving the highway? You put this Casparian strip or you put these check posts. At the check posts, the water, the symplastic pathway water will, will be stopped and it will be checked and will be made, it will be forced to enter through the city police. It will be forced to enter into the cell membrane so that if any poisons are present, that will remain outside and only the water can enter. So essentially, the very simple processes, apoplastic and symplastic. Apoplastic has its own benefits, like there's regulation of what's going in and what's going out. Uh, we can control if we need water or if we don't need water. Um, the, and that's maintained by this Casparian strip right here, but it's very slow as you can imagine. So, uh, and symplastic has its own benefits. So for instance, it's very fast, it's a highway. Quickly water can enter, enter. So the plant does not become dehydrated, does not die. So that's very important things to keep in mind for both of these processes. And then apoplastic is obviously osmosis. I've already told you when water travels across a cell membrane, it's called osmosis. Symplastic is simple diffusion. So you can remember symplastic from simple diffusion because it's not crossing cell membranes. It's remaining within the highway, within the cell walls, um, running through them according to the concentration gradient. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, what I mean is, you know, osmosis and diffusion are passive processes. Both of them do not need energy. So there, the, and the, what forces them to happen is a strong concentration gradient. If there's a lot of blue water over here, it will be forced to enter into the xylem down the concentration gradient, right? But what happens if this xylem became, becomes stagnant? What happens if water collects here? Then no more water can move in. So this, this, this process, these processes will come to a halt. So how do we, how does a plant ensure that this movement takes place? It continuously happens that there is no stop in this water movement. The process is very easy. Let me show you the process. As soon as you see it, you'll be like, oh yeah, very easy. Water keeps in rotation. It is taken up, moves up the stem, le reaches the leaves. And from the leaves, just like from our skin, it gets evaporated. So if you remember, even in your O-level, ever since you've been doing plant biology, you know that water leaves the leaf, right? It does get evaporated. So as the water is leaving from here, 
more water, there's empty space over here, water from here moves up, and there's empty space over here, water from the soil moves into the root, and this becomes a continuous cycle, which is why they always say water is in a cycle. It's going to move in, with, uh, it's going to probably precipitate, rain, rain will be taken up by the soil, and then this process will occur again. Now, we've looked at the pathway by which the root manages through the sim, uh, symplastic and the epoplastic pathways. Then we know that normal one unidirectional transport through those dead xylem vessels will occur to the leaves. Now we need to know how this water moves out of this leaf. So in this diagram, you need to be able to recognize these structures, these layers, and how water is moving through. The next diagram is going to be about the leaf and how water is moving through the leaf, how it's um, coming about. Um, I, I, need, I need one minute, I'll be back. Okay, so let's see these structures in detail now. Okay, never mind. This is the next slide. Okay, so I need to be able to see the leaf structure in detail. I want to be able to see the leaf to understand what's happening in the leaf. Like I told you about those three uh, three layers of structure, leaf have a different layer of structure. So the, let's talk go one by one. Let's start from uh, let's start from the top. Okay, so that you know there is a thick leaf, and what's happening basically is there is a number of different cells arranged in the leaf. If you start from the top. There is on the topmost layer, we have a waxy layer called a cuticle. Now this cuticle, you know, whenever something is waxy, it's preventing loss of water because fats or waxes or cholesterol are highly, uh, highly non-polar. So they will repel, repel water and keep water outside, right? Basic science knowledge. So this waxy layer of cuticle exists um, and this vaccine layer will cover all of the cell except these opening. And these openings are essentially called stoma. So in the topmost layer, we have a vaccine layer and an opening. And this opening exists, why? Because remember that process of carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide plus water giving us carbohydrate and oxygen? Well, this is the exact um, place, the stoma is the opening from which gases can come in and gases can go out. So now for the next time, remember when somebody asks you how a gas enters a plant cell, it's from the stoma and the stoma do not only exist on a leaf, they occur on the barks, they occur on the stems, they occur everywhere except the roots, obviously, because roots are not in contact with air. So stoma is an opening right or and many stoma are called stomata so you must have heard that word it's just an opening under these two layers the basic layers are the actual living cells the living cells include guard cells they are cells 
that control the stoma. They can open and close the stoma to control when gases can enter, when gases can't enter, to control if we need more gases, the opening will become larger. If we net less gases, the opening will become smaller. If you put a plant in a poisonous gas, it will immediately close to the guard cells will immediately close to push the stoma opening together and close it, okay? So the, there's guard cells defending the stoma and the rest of the cells are just called the epidermis. Just like I told you, outermost epidermis, a single layer of protective top cells. And so we know a leaf is double-sided, right? It has an upper layer and a lower layer. So both of them are out on the outside. Both of them should be an epidermis, right? And that is the case. There is the layer on the top of a leaf, the glossy part uh, or on the top of a leaf. When you pick a leaf, you can easily tell that this is the top and this is the bottom. So the top, the top epidermis is called the upper epidermis and the, the lower, low, lower side of the leaf has the lower epidermis. And similarly, the upper has waxy layer, lower has waxy layer, and upper has stoma, stomata, lower has stomata, upper has guard cells, lower has guard cells. Look at these, there's these two being shaped over here and these two over here being illustrated around this stoma are guard cells. The normal um, rectangular cells that you see in that resemble the normal cells that are drawn for plant cells are the epidermal cells. Okay, then we have the inner structure. Now the inner structure is essentially um, divided into, into parts, right? The inner self structure contains what is called um, our vascular structures and the mesophilic structures, okay? So the inner structures are mesophilic structures, which are the cells, the vascular structures, which are ca carrying stuff, it, which are xylem and phloem, and then the air spaces. We need air spaces. Why do we need air spaces? Very easy. All of this carbon dioxide needs to be kept somewhere, right? It can't just, you know, come into the cell. The cell doesn't have enough space for these things. The cell is highly regulated. So we need three. We have three important structures inside. The transport system, the mesophilic system, and the air spaces. Transport for bringing stuff in, taking it out, air space for the breathing of the cell, um, and meso structure for photosynthesis. So very easy to understand. You do not need to cram this. Just know that there are three important inside structures. Photosynthetic is photosynthetic called the mesophyll structure, the vascular structure, and the air spaces. Now we need to know the three different airs. The, 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 so the, the differences within them. So air spaces, we know empty spaces, no cells really. Vascular button bundles we've talked about are the xylem and the phloem. Um, and then the, la the last one left. So we need to know the cells, but the, now the photosynthetic or the mesophilic structure. It basically consists of two layers of cell. A very long identical cells that are arranged orderly called palisade mesophils and non-orderly um, randomly arranged having air spaces between them called the spongy mesophil. Spongy comes from uh, similar to sponge, which means they can retain water, they have spaces between them, they're very stretchy. Palisade means the arrangement is very uh, appropriate, identical. Uh, as you can see from here, the palisade mesophil are so identical and well-packed. Spongy have different sizes, different shapes, air spaces between them, etc. Okay, let's see, um, let's see the, uh, this from another perspective. So again, you can see that we have air spaces, vascular bundle can't be seen here, but you can see we have the stomata, the guard cells, um, the waxy cuticle on both sides and upper and the lower epidermis. This diagram is very nice in showing you how the upper epidermis has much lower number of stomata. In fact, it's showing none. And the lower epidermis has a large number of stomata, which means most of the exchange is going to occur from the stomata from the lower surface. Then you can appreciate the photosynthetic parts. Why do I, why are they photosynthetic? Because they are basically responsible for the chunk of the cell making all of the carbohydrate, right? So we have well-arranged palisade mesophils. 
in a single layer, can be double layer in some cells, and then spongy mesophyll all over the place with air spaces in between. And then these dark spots inside show you the chlorophyll that is present essentially in D cell in higher number. Um, this chlorophyll can be seen in the guard cell other than these, uh, and only these cells and the guard cells are responsible because they have chlorophyll, they are photosynthetic. So just appreciate this here. Now, why do I need to know about the about this? Because like I told you, I was wanted to talk about water movement and xylem, but then I ended up telling you guys about the stoma and the gas movement. So why, why am I showing you this if I want to talk about water movement? Because if you wrap a paper around a leaf, you notice that it collects water. And in deserts, what ends up happening is some people use plants to collect water and then purify that water if they have no other resources. You've heard that people use cactus to drink water out of it, and etc. Why is that so? That is so because this tomata here are not only responsible for gas exchange, but also for water vapor exchange or water exchange. You remember, if you remember from general chemistry, water vapor, when water turns into steam, it becomes gas. But essentially it's in a state called water vapor, which is water just in the air. And I told you all gaseous exchange takes place from the stoma. So water vapor exchange must take place as well. So this water collecting here is the water vapor that came out from the stoma or the stomata of the cells and it of the leaves and it we because we were we tied a water bag around it we collected it as simple as that now how this does this process of water moving out take place this process is very simple and it's uh, it's it's illustrated over here so i'm going to show you talk about this one by one and then we'll move on and see how this happens over here so, and you, you, why am I showing you these five steps? Because you need to be able to learn them and know them by heart. This comes up in almost every paper whenever they want to talk about transport and plants. So, no one of these. Okay. Okay. So, we have num step number one water vapor diffuses from air spaces through a stoma by a process. Okay. So, this is upside down. Let's start from topic uh, step number five. Let's direct, let's go from here. Let's start from this vessel over here, xylem over here, and take water all the way out of the stoma into the air. So let's see. Water moves up the xylem vessels. Water moves up the xylem vessels to replace the water from the leaf. We talked about this here, right? What happens is um, there is water, the water is lost from a leaf. As a result, the space over here becomes empty and it pulls water from the ground. What happens next is water leaves a xylem vessel. Okay. Water, once water enters over here due to this empty space, because this is con continuous process, it's a continuous process of removing water. Once more water comes in over here, when the previous water is used up, that water is going to leave the xylem vessel by the help of the non lignified spaces. I told you lignin deposits everywhere, but some places are left. Uh, left without lignin. So from those places that are left that have no lignin, water will move out into the air spaces. It's going to move into the cells and in air spaces both. So what happens is it moves out through a non-lignified area like a pit or if it's circular deposition of lignin, it can move out through that circular area. It can travel. Water travels by two ways, like I told you, symplastically or apoplastically. It can enter this cell and then move into the airways, or it can simply just enter outside of these cells, remain in the cell wall, and move into the air place spaces. Water moves through the mesophyll cell wall in through an apoplastic pathway or into the cytoplasm through a symplastic pathway. It then evaporates from the cell wall or from the cell membrane, evaporates it can move from cell into the cell or just into the cell wall. It can move from here into the cell, same plastic or just into the cell wall. And then the one process that we need to convert it into vapor has to occur. It cannot just simply move out, which is why plants love the sunlight. Why do plants love sunlight? They love it because they want to make food out of it, chlorophyll. And the second reason is that kinetic energy, that heat, 
why, why is it that spring and summers have higher number of flowering and general plants as compared to winter? Because that heat, what it does, it, it evaporates water from both the cell wall and inside the cell and causes it to enter, form a layer of film outside the cell wall and enter into the air spaces. Now, when a large amount of water vapor is over here, it will move down the concentration gradient through the stoma or stomata into the atmosphere where it is in less concentration. And that, that movement, water vapor into the air spaces and then from the air spaces through the stoma, um, I think you can't see my point. Okay, then from the um, so from the from the cell from the cell membrane onto the uh, onto the cell wall through evaporation and into the air spaces, it creates a very high concentration in the air spaces, and then through a process similar of diffusion, it will move outside from the stoma into the atmosphere, and this diffusion. What this will lead is more water from the xylem moves outside into the air spaces through evaporation, move more water into the cell wall and the cell evaporating into the air spaces, moving out more water, less water over here means more water is pulled from the root hair cells into this place. And this continues that cycle of more pulling water in, moving it here and moving it out. And as water is pulled, and as water moves out from this, it, it is a process called transpiration, okay? The plants transpire water, they move, and this whole process is transpiration. There isn't a single word that can define transpiration. It's this whole process of five steps that I explained to you. It's better if you move from number five to number one because it becomes easier and more comprehensible. Okay, but yeah, that's essentially your five steps. Um, and and other things are very easy. For instance, when water is being pulled uh, from this stream over here, it is empty over here. It's been pulled upwards. We call it a transpiration stream. Why? Because this stream is being created because of transpiration. The force that occurs because of this transpiration stream is called the transpiration pull. So these words are very easy. Just don't uh, make them too overwhelming for yourself. Don't use them if you don't want to. But like I told you, A-level wants you to use good words. So make sure you use words like transpiration stream, transpiration pull. Make sure you don't forget that evaporation uh, causes water to enter the air spaces, that these two movements move water from the cell, uh, from from the xylem to the cell uh, to the cells that diffusion moves water out of the air spaces into the atmosphere so just remember these keywords and you're good to go and with that we are at 8 51 um uh any questions from this topic no miss do you guys understand transpiration yeah yes teacher Okay, perfect. So that covers a big chunk of our uh, syllabus. Now all we have left is the anatomical part and the drawing part, which is cells, how they look like, and we're going to do that tomorrow. Okay, go back and read transpiration. Make sure you okay. do that. Okay. 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 Are we good to go? Anybody yes, yes. have questions? No. no. Perfect. That's our today's class then. Bye-bye, teacher. Bye. Thank you, sir. Love. Love is.